Hello there, welcome to Showcase. Christopher Nolan is known for delving into either science or fantasy to create larger-than-life blockbusters. With his latest feature, he attempts to reach that scale of filmmaking by focusing on a science of a dangerous kind. This is a national emergency. Detonator's charged. J. Robert Oppenheimer is at the center of Christopher Nolan's new feature. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. The film looks at the theoretical physicist's work. He was also vital to the creation of the atom bomb. In fact, he's often referred as its father. Secret laboratory. Keep everyone there until it's done. Let's go recruit some scientists. Reportedly, Oppenheimer is quoted as saying, at the A-bomb tests, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. In the middle of nowhere for who knows how long. Why? Why? How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? The makers of the movie say their story is about impossible questions and ethical dilemmas. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? These questions are expected to compel audiences and make them wonder how the atomic age with its dangers began. World War II would be over. The world will remember this day. Nolan says his aim was to show the relationship between theory and reality, and how in Oppenheimer's case, there was the possibility of destroying the entire world. Some believe the movie's release is timely. There's still the ongoing nuclear arm craze. But The Wire recognizes another reason, generative AI. The article likens its emergence to be not so dissimilar from the 1940s atmosphere of entering the atomic age. The men who gave them the power to destroy themselves. Hopefully, the, the consequences of artificial intelligence age won't be as dangerous. Moroccan pottery artisans and ceramists fear that their crafts are slowly dying and is not helped by a lack of clay and the appeal of cheaper Chinese products. All sorts of pottery items here in Sali are left out in the Moroccan sun to dry. It's one of the most crucial steps of the traditional craft, which nowadays not many artisans perform. Although it's been passed down from generation to generation, holding on to these skills over the years have become a challenge. Just ask Potter Ali Al Homri. We are struggling to find clay. We used to purchase it from quarries, and everyone was happy. But due to rampant urbanization, we no longer have access to clay. The quarries have been closed, and officials have no plans to open new ones. Now, we have to wait for trucks transporting clay from construction sites to come around so we could buy it from them. We also have to look for a suitable type of clay coming from these sites, or else we can't work. A few shops down, Mohammed Halfe sells various types of utensils crafted from clay, including the famous Moroccan tagine pots. But they now have competition. The Chinese are producing plastic vases. While we sell our vases for five dollars, the Chinese offer their plastic ones for two. Where will this end? We are left with no options as it's the same issue with all other kitchen utensils, from plates to tagines. Clay kitchenware is on the brink of disappearing and being replaced by cheap plastic alternatives from China. And at this workshop, Yusuf Al Hanmi shows how he decorates vases of various sizes with intricate floral patterns. 
He believes the way to keep customers interested in pottery is to be innovative. But he's also concerned that won't happen unless younger Moroccans become interested in making them. Only Murders in the Building has updated crime mystery for the 2020s. The show has received praise for its fresh approach to the genre as well as its majestic mix of actors. And as its third season looms upon us, we'll now set the record straight on the fan favorite series. We could multitask a little bit, silo out a second investigation, do a second podcast. No, we need to focus. Only Murders in the Building. Only Murders in the Building's third season drops in August. The makers of the show say they did their best to do it differently this time. For starters, the setting has changed. Previously, the crime scene was the character's apartment block. But now, it's a classic mystery setting, the theater. And the guest star of the third series is Meryl Streep. She plays the stage actor Loretta, who's touted as this season's mystery lady. Streep had long been an admirer of Only Murders in the Building. And who can blame her? Real opportunity here. Does anyone else feel like there's still a couple of loose ends? Get a new hobby. As long as it doesn't land you in jail. Like knitting? You understand the definition of perjury? I know what perjury is. Fans champion the show's multi-generational appeal. That is due in part to the performances of Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. I got in the elevator with these two weirdos. Then Tim got in the elevator. Approximately 12 minutes from now, I will be murdered. News outlets say its approach to the murder mystery genre with the podcast angle also makes the series original. We hope it will take us to clues. It's a wall and suspects. So what do we know about my daughter's murder? Maybe she killed Bunny. You think that woman stabbed someone eight times? We'll put a pin in her for now. The whole thing is the brainchild of Steve Martin, whose original plan was to have three men in their 70s as leads. But through collaborative effort, that idea changed and turned into the show which also draws inspiration from New Yorker magazine covers and the color palettes of Wes Anderson. Right now, the only thing that matters is that there's a killer on the loose in our building. Oh, that is a very good line. Badly delivered, but a good line. Martin says he's proud to have a hit at this point in his career and notes that his part of the washed-up actor was based on the fear of becoming one in real life. Exclamation point. It's so hot in here. Do we have to do this in a closet? The acoustics are better. And trust me, you need acoustics. I'm gonna pass out. And the 100% approval rating on the Rotten Tomatoes website shows that exorcising your fears may in fact lead to success. Keep your eyes peeled. Anything can be a clue. There's a very strong chance that the killer is musical superstar Sting. The guy from U2. Oh! This year, Copenhagen has been named world capital of architecture. And as the construction industry comes under increasing pressure to lessen its environmental impact, a new exhibit in the Danish capital is now promoting alternative and greener materials that could set the industry on a more sustainable path. Could future buildings be constructed with nettles or recycled plastics? Well, this new exhibit at the Copenhagen Contemporary Art Museum explores some experimental building materials and their applications. It's all for a more sustainable and cleaner environment. We are facing quite a lot of challenges and architecture has uh, one of the biggest uh, carbon footprints. So, not architecture itself, but the way how we build um, our environments. And here we have an uh, understanding of material or material canon that is now speaking in glass, in concrete. We um, source a lot of materials, in, um, uh, we extract them in a not 
not in a good manner, uh, and we put them into waste. So we don't have circular processes with our materials. And this was a really strong um, aspect, so because our, uh, we are limited in the materials we have in our world. The exhibit called Reset Materials puts on display the works of 10 teams, each consisting of architects, artists and manufacturers. From recycled plastics and silicon to biogenic materials such as mycelium, nettle and clay, the materials have been collected, cultivated, deconstructed and recomposed. And while some of them are already in use, others are still experimental. One of the things that we use a lot at the moment is uh, mineral wool. Mineral wool is, is basically stone uh, that is produced for an energy demanding process, heating it up basically, uh, and that means that we will use a lot of energy in that process. In contrast to this, we don't use nearly as much energy because basically the mycelium grows and creates the, the fiber network and the composite which has insulating properties. Reset Materials Towards Sustainable Architecture runs until the end of September with hopes to become a source of inspiration for visitors far and wide. The Beatles are one of the most filmed and photographed bands in history. And just when it seemed there are no more angles to explore, a new exhibition offers a fresh inside look at the band with images taken by none other than Paul McCartney. In 2020, Paul McCartney found images he had taken in the early 60s that documented the early days of the Fab Four through to the arrival of Beatlemania. McCartney teamed up with the National Portrait Gallery in London to open the exhibition titled Paul McCartney Photographs, 1963-64, Eyes of the Storm. Paul McCartney got in touch and said that he, he was working on a book um, on Linda McCartney, his former wife, who was a great photographer. And in going through the archive, he found a thousand photographs that he'd taken, which he thought had all been lost, of the early days of the Beatles. And he basically said, like, would you like to have a look? And do you think this could be interesting? Like, yes. The exhibition showcases 250 photos taken in England, France and the United States. They span images in rundown dressing rooms and small concerts in provincial theatres to stadium shows and luxury hotels. And these are not just casual snaps that a famous person took for fun. He is taking pictures to record them as memories, but also because he's sort of taking pictures, emulating the kind of photography that he was seeing in newspapers and magazines at the time. So there's a sort of a real combination between a snapshot, but then ones that you can see where he's trying to take a proper photograph. The exhibition is presented in a chronological order, starting from October 1963. So we have the kind of British scene uh, and the photographs really reflect that kind of post-war period in Britain. Uh, then they go to Paris, and the photographs taken in Paris, where they're doing a residency at the Olympia Theatre, are quite different. They're on the street. Some of them are quite tourist photographs of sort of Parisian street scenes, but also photographs of the other Beatles kind of hanging out, and they look really moody and cool. While in Paris, the band learns that their song I Want to Hold Your Hand has hit number one in the United States. And this opens a whole new chapter as they go to New York to perform on a TV show for tens of millions of people. And then the photographs, they uh, show them going to America, and that's when they performed on the Ed Sullivan Show to an audience of 73 million people, which was an unprecedented TV audience. Uh, and sort of after that moment, everything changes, and the photographs kind of show the sort of joy and kind of extraordinary reaction that people had to the Beatles when they went to America. For the sake of digital natives, the exhibition also explains how 35mm film worked and how photographs were taken and developed back in the day. And it will stay open until October.
Hundreds of treasures collected by Spanish monarchs are set to go on display later this month at a new museum in Madrid. The collection spans over five centuries and includes paintings, tapestries, furniture and royal carriages. The Royal Collections Gallery holds 650 works of art that once belonged to Spanish royals. Most of the works will be on show for the first time, and some were just collecting dust at historic sites across Spain. There are works that come from palaces or monasteries, and here we promote another way of looking at them. But there are other works, such as the White Horse of Velázquez or the Caravaggio, that were not kept hidden inside the palace, but at the same time, they weren't part of the tours for visitors to the royal palace either. Although the number of items on display is quite high, there is so much more to see. The museum has developed a system to bring even more national treasures on display. A third of the works is going to rotate, every year and a half, more or less, because the idea is to show all the national heritage we have. We can put the restored works on display and then they can go back to their original places. The collection offers a wide range of items, stunning art by Italian masters Caravaggio and Tintoretto stand next to Francisco de Goya's depiction of historic upheavals. Another significant item is the very first edition of Don Quixote and Spain's first female sculpture, Lisa Roldan's work, is also at the museum. The collection shows the diversity, richness and quality of what Spanish monarchs collected over a vast stretch of time. Celluloid film isn't immune to weather or other harsh conditions. That's why it could be in danger of disappearing forever. But as Ali Can Pami reports, one company in Turkey is protecting that celluloid heritage. And it has recently saved two of Peter Sellers' lost films. He learned, for instance, never underestimate a shopkeeper's own selling power. Dearth of a salesman and insomnia is good for you. This magic dishwasher of mine will do the work of six human dishwashers. Two incomplete and considered lost Peter Sellers films from the 1950s are now up for viewing in pristine condition. Yes, it's occupied by my feet. The hunt for missing reels of the flicks took collectors to different countries. By the 2020s, they were all brought together. And the job of restoring these gems were given to Turkish company Akın Telesine. It's a family business, now run by brothers Cem and Barış Aykut. International movie buffs trusted them because the restoration process they offer is quite unique. Why they prefer us? Uh, because uh, uh, we can say uh, we are uh, famous in the uh, UK, uh, especially about uh, AI, artificial intelligence uh, film restoration process. So this is a unique process, uh, unique, uh, we, uh, we made these uh, AI uh, algorithms and models. And the, this model is the version 3 model. So uh, with this uh, AI uh, algorithm, uh, we can uh, remove all the dust and scratches, uh, approximately uh, 85 and 90 percent automatically. So uh, after this automatized uh, process, uh, we can fix uh, frame by frame uh, all the uh, pictures and uh, reprocess and uh, remaster. So uh, this, uh, our, our AI system is uh, very popular in the UK. Uh, and they prefer us, uh, thanks God, they prefer us. Uh, and uh, we uh, restored uh, these two uh, Peter Sellers films in 4K resolution. The company is also responsible for giving older Turkish movies a modern makeover. They 
are also in demand by the British when it comes to entrusting their royal heritage. And saving these films all come out of the same demanding process, which requires the highest tech equipment available. First of all, uh, we analyze the film. Uh, we analyze uh, the perforations uh, of the film. Is there, an, uh, there is a crack uh, or uh, some dusts? Uh, we fix uh, physically, uh, first of all, the films. After that, uh, we put uh, the film uh, in the, uh, our uh, ultrasonic film uh, cleaner. Uh, it has a 3M liquid, it's a very special liquid, and uh, with the, uh, this liquid and uh, the ultrasound uh, process, uh, uh, it cleans uh, the films, uh, it removes the dusts uh, on the films. And after that, uh, we put it uh, to our scanners. Uh, if uh, the producer wants 2K, uh, we put it to, to our uh, 2K scanners. If they want uh, 4K, uh, these are uh, the other scanners. So uh, when we put uh, these films uh, in the uh, scanners, uh, we control uh, the scanners with these remote controllers. And while scanning, uh, we color graded them. We color graded, we, uh, we adjusted uh, illumination and uh, contrast. Uh, and after that, uh, we digitize uh, all the films to the digital uh, hard drives. Uh, after that, uh, we put uh, all the digitized uh, data uh, to our AI system. All that technicality aside, preserving film is important for various reasons that concern us all. Film restoration is uh, so important uh, for me. Because uh, when you remove a footage uh, of film, uh, you recover all the uh, info, uh, all the uh, cultural her heritage uh, of the film. Uh, you may uh, restore uh, a, a comedy or cinema film or a doc documentary film or uh, a cultural uh, historical film. But when you restore, especially in uh, higher resolutions, uh, you recover uh, another details that has not been seen uh, before. So it's very, very, very important in a uh, cultural stage and uh, art stage and also histor uh, historical uh, stage. And it's thanks to celluloid archaeologists like these that the rich history of film will reach future generations. Alijan Pamir, TRT World. Istanbul. A group of artists have organized an auction and a gala in New York to raise funds to restore the childhood home of music legend and civil rights activist Nina Simone. And they collected far more money than what they expected. Here is more. This modest wooden house in rural North Carolina is Nina Simone's childhood home. It had been neglected for years. In 2017, four African-American artists, Julie Merritt II, Alan Gallagher, Rashid Johnson, and Adam Pendleton, bought a house and started a campaign to turn the property into a cultural site. And it's important that it remains as a place that people can both see and visit because it's a way of keeping Nina and her legacy, her music, alive for generations to come. The auction and the gala were expected to raise about $2 million, but the events brought in almost $6 million. The team worked hard to auction off 11 items, including works donated by British painter Cecily Brown and American artist Sarah C all in an effort to secure years-long funding for such a significant site. We believe that this historic place is where her legacy can endure and where the public can have a multi-sensory experience by just touching the walls of the house or walking the same landscape where Nina 
Simone once walked. We're seeing the church and the neighborhood and community where she grew up. There is a lot of power in that historic place and we want to ensure that it's preserved in perpetuity. With a surprise bump in funding, the house will open its doors to visitors in 2024. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adrist from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching and bye for now.